And we are going to do section 4.2 today. And section 4.2, there's no use sort of denying it, is a weird section. Or maybe it's just a weird section for where it is in the textbook because this is applications of the derivative. This is where we're supposed to be using the derivative to solve these concrete problems and wedged between absolute and local extrema is this theoretical section where mainly going to be talking about something called the mean value theorem today and the applications of that theorem. But we'll start with something called rules theorem. And Again, has to be said, usually if a theorem has a name, like rules theorem, rather than a theorem 2.4 in the textbook, it means that theorem is important. Rules theorem is more of a lemma, by which I mean that Rolle's theorem gets used once in most calculus classes and then is never talked about again, but it is part of the standard curriculum. So let's get into it. We've got a function, we've got an interval. Let's say that three conditions are satisfied. X is continuous on the entire interval. So that's not a harsh restriction. All of the functions we look at in sort of day-to-day -day math are continuous on their domains. F is going to be differentiable on what we call the interior of the interval, which just means all of the points except for the end point. And I'll give an example of this in just a moment. But the third condition is the real condition. This is, this is the condition that you would not expect most functions to satisfy, F is equal at the end points. So you've got some function, it does whatever it's doing, but it begins and it ends at the same value. Then, says Rolle's theorem, there is a value C in this interval such that F prime of C equals C 
zero. And I know maybe your immediate reaction to this is not to be super impressed. Let's at least show it. We've got this picture up here on the upper right. This function is continuous, it's differentiable, its value at the beginning end point and at the end end point are the same. And in fact, in the case of this particular function, there are three faces where the derivative is zero. Not coincidentally, and relating this to the video from yesterday, all of the local extrema are where the derivative is zero. We'll get back to that in the next section. So Rule's theorem doesn't say there will be three values. It says there will be at least one value. It's, you can, you know, create a function like that. This satisfies the conditions of Rowe's theorem. And there is a value, the absolute extrema of the function, relating back to what we talked about on Tuesday, there is a value where the derivative is zero. And I'm not going to give some kind of formal proof of Rowe's theorem. I'm just going to say that we know from Tuesday that absolute extrema, well, I guess I am going to give a formal proof or something like it. We know from Tuesday that absolute extrema occur when the derivative equals zero or the derivative does not exist or at end points. We also know from Tuesday that if we have a continuous function on this closed interval, absolute extrema exists. So we now look at the conditions of Rowe's theorem, and we ask ourselves, well, if these conditions are satisfied, what, where are the absolute extrema? Are the absolute extrema at the end points? Are the absolute extrema um, faces where the derivative is zero? Or are the absolute extrema faces where the derivative does not exist? And we can get rid of that last possibility right away. This function, if it satisfies Rowe's theorem, is differentiable. So these absolute extrema that definitely exist either occur where the function is zero or they occur at the end points of the interval. 
And using extrema here, the plural of extremum advised me. Remember that there's a maximum and there's a minimum. What about the endpoints? Well, remember that the values of the endpoints are equal in the context of Rolle's theorem. You somehow have to connect this endpoint to this endpoint. And you have to connect these endpoints if these endpoints represent both the absolute max and the absolute min, then when you connect the endpoints, you can't go up at all because you can't be above an absolute maximum. And you can't go down at all because you can't be below an absolute minimum. And all that leaves is that if these endpoints are both the absolute max and the absolute min, the function is a horizontal line. And in fact, the derivative equals zero everywhere. And those then are our two options. The absolute extrema have to exist. We could just have some value where the derivative is zero, or the derivative could be zero everywhere in this last kind of three case. But either way, the derivative is zero somewhere. That's Rolle's theorem. Um, as I say, don't get too attached to it. We're going to use it once and then never refer to it again. And the once is going to be right now when we introduce something we care about much more than Rolle's theorem. Called the mean value theorem. <laughs> mean meaning average here, not nasty. And the setting of the mean value theorem, sorry that we pause, that people catch their breaths. Does anybody have any questions so far? Then the setting of, oh, negative two degrees Celsius, first freezing day of the year, I think. Anyway, the setting of the mean value theorem is up to a point, the same as the setting of Rolle's theorem. We've got a function, it's defined on an interval. It's continuous on BC. It's continuous on the whole interval, including the endpoints. And it's differentiable.
on doesn't have to be differentiable at the endpoints, but it's differentiable on an open interval, the interval without the endpoints. And the mean value theorem um, does not have any other conditions. The mean value theorem does not assume that f of a was f of b, like Rowe's theorem did. These are the only conditions that the mean value theorem requires that we have. The sort of resolution of the mean value theorem starts out exactly the same as Rowe's theorem does. The mean value theorem tells us that there's a function, a value, sorry, C, such that the derivative at C is F of B, minus f of a over b minus a. So what the heck is this? Is maybe our first, uh, our first response. This, um, this does not seem immediately impressive, or at least it certainly did it to me when I first saw this. But the mean value theorem is telling you something pretty fundamental. Let's take a look. at this equality. And let's look at both sides of the equality. On the right, we have the average rate of change. On the interval from A to B, and on the left, we have the instantaneous rate of change at this value of C. And we have that equality connecting them. So the mean value theorem, when you strip away all of the mathematical symbols and all of the kind of complicated looking conditions, the mean value theorem is telling you something pretty, pretty logical and pretty intuitive. The mean value theorem is saying that if something is changing, then at some point, its rate of change 
pose its average rate of change. And if that's still not doing it for you, let's look at a more concrete example. Let's say that we have a falling object. So S of T, Remember that we traditionally use S for position from the German. S of T is the height of the falling object after T seconds. And S prime of T is the velocity. And what the mean value theorem is telling you, for example, is that if object fell, if the object fell, don't know why I referred to caveman speak there. If the object fell, with an average velocity of negative three meters per second, then at some point, The object was falling at exactly negative three meters per second. At some point, the average rate of change and the exact instantaneous rate of change have to be the same. That's what the mean value theorem tells you. I mean, assuming this is true, assuming that a falling object's position is both continuous and differentiable. And again, that's the mean value theorem. In 99 cases out of 100, we don't have to worry about allegedly having two different conditions. As I said, in 99 cases out of 100, it's going to be continuous everywhere and differentiable everywhere. And you won't have to worry about, well, it's is it differentiable at the endpoints? Does it need to be? Is it continuous at the endpoints? Does it need to be? Because the overwhelming um, number of functions that we look at are just continuous everywhere and differentiable almost everywhere. But 
if you wanted an example where those conditions did matter, let's look at f of x equals the square root of x on the interval from zero to one. And let's ask if this satisfies the conditions of the mean value theorem. Well, it's definitely continuous. I mean, I know continuity, that section was long ago by now, but we gave, at some point, we gave you a big list of continuous functions, and we said that power functions are continuous on their domains. And the square root of x, is a power function. It's x to the one half power. So continuity, no problem. What about differentiability? Well, we can explicitly find the derivative, and we find that it is not differentiable at to zero. At x equals zero, we get a division by zero error. Let's make sure that this claim is fair to everybody. The reason that it's not differentiable at zero is simply that if you plug zero into the derivative, you get an error, a division by zero error. So it's not differentiable on this entire interval, but that's okay. That's not a problem because for the mean value theorem, it doesn't need to be differentiable at the end points. It doesn't need to be differentiable at zero. It doesn't need to be differentiable at one. It needs to be differentiable at every other point, which it is. Um, I'm using the using the notation of the mean value theorem here. Let's go explicit. This is differentiable everywhere but zero. Is that clear to everybody? Does anybody have any questions so far? So like if the quiz asks you, does a function satisfy the conditions of the mean value theorem? You know sort of how to investigate that using continuity from the previous section, and then just looking at the derivative and deciding whether the derivative is defined everywhere. Well, since we've gone so far as to as to um, argue or demonstrate that this function does satisfy the conditions of the mean value theorem, let's. Do 
give ourselves some space to work. And let's see if this function, if the mean value theorem is true. Let's state a goal to finish out this example by finding C such that F prime of C equals F of B minus F of A over B minus A. Stuff like this is what most of the quiz actually is. Um, Here's a function, it satisfies the conditions of the mean value theorem. Find the C that the mean value theorem says exists. Um, these problems are very artificial, but I'm going to dodge responsibility and say that I don't think anyone has really cracked the nut of how to give non-artificial mean value theorem homework. It's the same set of problems that everyone who takes calculus ends up doing. So if it's artificial, at least I'm not in the worst company. And with this as our goal, what do we need? Well, we need the derivative We should be able to find the derivative of the square root without a lot of effort at this point. And we need the average rate of change, which is then C. Where do I want to write? I want to write somewhere where people can see. So let me go over here. The average rate of change is the square root of one minus the square root of zero divided by one minus zero, which at the end of the day is one. Um, the square root of one is one, the square root of zero is zero, so, this is one minus zero over one minus zero, which is one. And the claim is that there is a value such that the derivative at that value equals the average rate of change. What you have on the left there is F um, prime, F prime of C. What you have on the right is the average rate of change. And the mean value theorem says that somewhere in this interval, that equality is satisfied. Might be satisfied in more than one location, 
but it certainly satisfied somewhere. And solving this now becomes a quick, uh, quick algebra exercise. Multiply both sides by the denominator of that fraction. Divide both sides by the two. Square both sides. And we have found our value with C. And um, the mean value theorem says that the average rate of wealth, the mean value theorem says that C exists. But it's true that the average rate of change at one fourth equals the derivative. It equals the instantaneous rate of change. If you looked at the mean value theorem graphically, what the mean value theorem is saying the average rate of change is the slope of that secant line. The mean value theorem is saying that at some point, the tangent line and the secant line are parallel. I guess, it's one of the less edifying proofs, but I guess if we're going to introduce Rolls theorem, we'd better give its one and only application. Which is to prove that the mean value theorem is true. So we have this function f. We've got this closed interval. f satisfies some conditions. And uh, this, is, this is my least favorite kind of proof, to be honest, where the textbook or the professor in this case um, just seems to pull something out of the air. But the proof of the mean value theorem involves defining this new function. And if F is continuous and differentiable, this new function H of X is continuous and differentiable as well. That's because H of X is built up of continuous and differentiable functions. It's, you know, built up by subtracting them and multiplying them and dividing them. And those things all preserve continuity and differentiability. Let's see. H of zero equals H of A. Um, in particular, 
they both equal zero. If you stick zero in there, it's a little harder to see, but you do, sorry, where is a zero coming from? That's a typo. H of B equals H of A equals zero. Um, that's not the most obvious thing in the world, but like if you stick A in here, this turns to zero, this turns to zero, F of A minus F of A is Z. Heck, we're not gonna finish this material today. So what's the use of trying to run through it? H of A, equals f of a minus f of a minus f of b minus f of a over b minus a times a minus a. And what happens here is that this is zero, which causes all of this to be zero. And then F of A minus F of A is zero. So that whole thing is zero. So H of A equaling zero is true. H of B. equaling zero. Um, when you have H of B, those B minus A's cancel, and you get F of B minus F of A minus F of B plus F of A, and the whole thing does indeed turn to zero. So, as I say, one of my, my less favorite proofs, it's, I mean, we're going to see that it works. It's not really edifying. You can probably guess the next step. F of H of B equaling H of A is exactly the condition we need to hit this with Rolle's theorem. Let's give me some space to work. Rowe's theorem says that at some point H prime is zero. If we find H prime, take the derivative of the right. The derivative of F is F prime. The derivative of a constant is zero. The only things that survive when we take the derivative are that. And Rolle's theorem says that this is true. Well, Rolle's theorem says 
that for some value of C, this is equal to zero. That's the mean value theorem. Add that fraction to both sides, F prime of C. equals f of b minus f of a over b minus a. So that's kind of is what it is. Um, Rowe's theorem is what would traditionally be called a lemma meaning that we're only really interested in it as a tool to prove something we care about more. So we're only really interested in Rowe's theorem because it is used in the proof of the mean value theorem. The mean value theorem is critically important. I've probably not done a very good job so far of convincing anyone of that because we just needed to state the theorem and we wanted to give a proof and we wanted to do that example with the square root. But let's see, Monday we'll give at applications of the mean value theorem. And these are major applications. I, and I don't mean like, oh, it shows up occasionally in business. I mean like half of calculus two is based on the mean value theorem. It really is significant. I'll have to take a look at the quizzes. Um, you probably can't finish the me at this quiz yet because we haven't looked at um looked at the application. So that would leave us with the absolute extremo quiz due Saturday. I will see you Monday. Have a Halloween, I guess. Mm -hmm. huh? It's a